Okay, let's get started then. Did any the questions I asked you last time about how many cells in a baby and a human and so on, did anybody actually check into that? Was anybody curious and went and found out you did? Six times ten to the thirteen. What is six times ten to the thirteen? Six with thirteen zeros after it. What kind of number is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Thirteen? Oh. I got carried away with my counting. I did. I was on a roll. All right, so if we've got six zeros, that's how many? A million. And if we've got nine zeros, billion. that's a billion. And if we've got 12 zeros, 60 trillion cells in an adult. Well done, Shauna. Well done. All right? Yeah. That's 60 trillion cells in an adult human. So how many in a newborn baby? Same number. Same number? So you think it's got the same number of cells, but each individual cell must be much, much smaller? No, not quite. Some of the cells are smaller. How many in a newborn baby? Any ballpark estimates? You could work it out by thinking, all right, um, how many fewer cells maybe, and how many of the cells are going to be the same size, how many smaller? Get a ballpark. What do you think? There's 10 billion just in the brain. Okay, 10 billion just in the brain. About 2 trillion in a newborn baby. About 2 trillion cells. <coughs> How many red blood cells do you think you got? It's a lot. And I'm not quite sure if this number includes white blood cells, but there's not many of them compared to red. About 25 trillion red blood cells. It's a lot, isn't it? When you donate blood, how much blood do you give away when you donate blood? How much is it? Is it a pint? They won't let me donate blood here. No. I thought it was because I travelled a lot to places with weird diseases, but they said no, it's because I was English. <laughs> and, they're wor and they're worried about mad cow disease. That's why, really, yeah. Yeah. I've swum in lakes with Bill Harzier and all that kind of stuff, but no, mad cow disease for England, that's what they're worried about. So I can't, so what, a pint of blood maybe? So if you donate a pint, if that's what you really give away when you donate blood, there's about 5.4 billion red blood cells that you're giving away. It's pretty charitable, isn't it? That you've never thought about giving away 5.4 billion of anything. But it's a drop in the ocean, really. You don't really miss it, because each day your body replaces sloughs off your skin, your digestive system, repairs and replaces cells. About 600 billion cells per day you're replacing. Is it true that your body will regenerate itself in seven years? I don't know. That's a good question. Honestly, I don't know the answer to that. So red blood cells are something that are produced replaced fairly quickly. They've got a shelf life or an, uh, an active life of about 120 days. So in your bone marrow, every second, you're making about 2 million new red blood cells. Every second. And those red blood cells are jam-packed with what protein? That carries the hemoglobin. And they're jam-packed with millions upon millions of molecules of hemoglobin. So think about how many of those your body's churning out every second. Right? Okay. So I think we finished talking about cell size. Right? And on the subject of cell size, I brought, thought I'd bring this in. This is one of those ostrich eggs that I showed you. And um, it was a wonderfully intact ostrich egg shell until it got broke. And this was a... No, actually, I guess I could tell that story, but how would I account for that hole there? It's not where the baby came out. You blew it. Well, chipped a hole in it to shake, shake the egg out, but it was a nice intact eggshell. No, it was um, nosy students in my office one day were handling it and dropped it. Oh. He felt very bad. And so then I threw him off the top of the building. No, I didn't. <laughs> All right. Sorry? That's an ostrich. 
have you ever seen an emu? Yeah, I've got one of those in my office. <laughs> they're, they're a bit more oval, and they're kind of like a turquoisey blue. Yeah, yeah, weird colour. All right, so limits on cell size. What I said last time is that this is a concept that you either sort of like, yep, clicks, got it, or it's a concept you've got to review and it takes time. And so in the interest of time in lecture, I wanted to sort of give you, buzz over it a little bit, but I'm going to refer you to the book. And uh, in some ways I hate to do that, but I'm going to refer you to the book. And if it's still um, not quite clear to you, then come see me in office hours, all right? And we'll explain it, okay? All right, so limits on cell size. It has to do with the surface area to volume ratio and the surface area over which the cells can move in and out substances they need, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, glucose, any raw material, anything that's imported or exported to the cell. Okay? Think of it like a football stadium, right? There are turnstiles to get you in and out. Okay? As the stadium gets bigger, it can hold more people, the volume increases, but the surface area, the number of turnstiles they can put in, doesn't get, doesn't increase proportionally the same. So relative to the volume, there are fewer turnstiles, so it's more difficult to get people in and out. Same thing with the cell. Okay. All right. So we're going to focus on the eukaryotic cell, all right, for this tour of the cell. And many things are similar in prokaryotes, but there are many things that are different. All right, but we're going to focus on the eukaryotic cell. And I'm probably going to focus on a generic animal cell. And then I'll add some things to that generic, generic animal cell to show you, you know, how you can sort of make the next leap to get a plant cell or maybe a fungal cell. But the basic, basic structures are the same in all eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells then are characterized by having this internal system of membranes. And that compartmentalizes the cell. It gives you lots of compartments within the cell. And by compartmentalizing things, you can get these very localized environments that have maybe the appropriate conditions of pH or concentration of a certain substances to allow certain reactions to go on. And I'll give you lots of examples of these. But here's the best analogy I can think about. Think about your kitchen, right? You've got lots of compartments in your kitchen, don't you? You've got your fridge. That keeps stuff cold. And there's certain things you'd put in your fridge. And then you've got maybe jars and bottles where you keep stuff in the jars and the bottles and the packets. And it's to keep things separate, isn't it? to keep maybe the, the conditions inside a bit separate, but also stop things from mixing. You wouldn't want your vinegar to mix with your baking soda, right? <laughs> so, you know why, yeah, they react. You know, made those volcanoes when you were a little kid. It's, you know. um, so the eukaryotic cell is very similar. It's got all these compartments to stop things mixing that shouldn't mix and to keep very localized environments, okay? talked about proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and to some degree nucleic acids. So I'm going to point out some of these structures that we're going to talk about. And you'll understand most of this once we've talked about the cell. These are pores in the nucleus. This is part of the cytoskeleton, different elements of the cytoskeleton. Many of them are made of proteins. This is a part of the cytoskeleton being assembled from the subunits. That gives the cell structure or tension, strength. That's an enzyme cleaving it, breaking it. This is a microtubule, which is a protein being assembled from protein subunits, and there it's being disassembled. And these act as like the rails for the cell to enable these motor proteins to drag vesicles around, maybe to move a substance from where it's produced to the outside of the cell. 
It's a mitochondria up there. This is the nucleus, these are nuclear pores. And these are strings of messenger RNA. And this is an organelle called a ribosome, and it's where proteins are made. There's the ribosome, reading the information from the messenger RNA and producing a protein inside that vesicle. The vesicles then are filled full of whatever it is has been produced. Maybe it's a protein like insulin, and then it's moved. This is the Golgi apparatus, and the vesicles fuse with the Golgi apparatus. Their content is modified, and then it's usually taken to the exterior of the cell where it's released. So whatever this substance is, is being released, and now it's forming part of the cell membrane. Outside the cell membrane, there's this extracellular matrix of chemicals. And these are probably proteins or carbohydrates. And there's your white blood cell. So I just love that movie. I think I like the music as much as anything else. Sorry? What did you say? A vesicle fused with the Golgi apparatus. All right? And again, it seems double Dutch right now, yeah? It won't be double Dutch. All right, here's going to be my challenge to you then. I'm going to challenge you to draw a cell, not right now, in two minutes, with all the components we talked about, with basic labels, and maybe a few annotations. All right? That's what I want to challenge you to do. And you, you, you can do it, right? If that voice says, I can't, what do you do? You pop it, right? Pop a cap in it. This, this detail? Um, well, no, when you draw your cells, you're going to you know, draw them as well as you can. But yeah, with this kind of detail, OK? So I'll tell you a good way to practice drawing your cells. Have you ever heard of those shower crayons, crayons that you can use in the shower? Yeah, get some of those. If you're worried about how much time you've got, you know, spend two minutes longer in the shower and draw your cell on the shower walls and it just washes right off. Or get sidewalk chalk and do it with your kids or the neighbor's kids or something. Draw a great big cell and then tell them to jump on the nucleus and they say, all right, now jump out the nucleus, jump on the endoplasmic reticulum. Now you're a vesicle, go along a microtubule to the Golgi apparatus. They'll think you're mad, but it's a fun way to, you know, to practice the cell, right? All right, so I do want you to take a clean sheet of paper, though, one sheet, and I want you to draw the cell, but construct it as we go along, component by component, all right? So I'm going to use blue to represent cell membrane. You can use color if you want, or just use pencil, but whenever I draw blue, it indicates cell membrane. So not necessarily the cell membrane, but it represents membrane, okay? Plasma membrane. So there's our cell membrane, okay? So let's label it, cell membrane. Draw it nice and big, but leave space for labels and annotations. You'll find this will probably be your best way to study the cell, to self-test just draw a cell. Make sure you can draw it with all of the components, label the components, and then put annotations by them which describes their function. Okay, it's the best way to study the cell. So we're going to start then with the nucleus. There we go, nucleus. All right. And the nucleus actually has a double membrane.
So I'm going to draw that other membrane super, super close, but I'm not going to connect them. So there's my nucleus, okay? And I'll label that. Nucleus. And what I suggest you do is add to your drawing, and then as you take your notes on the different components of the cell, you know, get a heading, nucleus. Then we'll discuss the nucleus. Then make another heading for the next organelle. You can number them if you want. All right, so the nucleus then. <clears throat> All eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. And that's not quite true. Some of them, at functional maturity, don't have a nucleus. Like your red blood cells don't have a nucleus at functional maturity. Okay? But what's weird is things like birds, their red blood cells do have a nucleus in. Why there's a difference, I don't know. So here's the nucleus then. Nucleus contains most of your genes. What are genes made of? DNA, DNA right? So the nucleus contains most genes. <clears throat> in fact, nearly all of your genes. There are a few other genes in your cells in your mitochondria. All right? You can write that as a little side note if you want. But the nucleus contains virtually all of your DNA. It's about five microns in diameter, five micrometers in diameter. What's the little symbol for, symbol for micrometer? The U with the little curly tails, right? That's milli. No, it doesn't. No rubbish. Look. It's like a U, see? A U with little cur with tails on it. Yeah? If you insist. But then you get it confused with the real M for Millie. No, that looks completely different. Oh, crikey, all right. <laughs> it's about five microns in diameter. So how would you compare the size of, of a nucleus to something else you're familiar with, another cell that you've looked at? What might you compare it to in terms of size? Yes, good. Bacteria. That's it. Bacteria are about, you know, bacteria vary in size, but five microns is not a bad size for a bacteria. So nucleus is about the same size as bacteria. Okay? Got most of your genes. In fact, it's where almost all of your DNA is located. So we'll just put DNA there. <clears throat> and it's this double membrane, okay? It's like two layers. So it's double wrapped. And the nuclear membrane is studded with these pores. Loads and loads and loads of pores. So these diagrams, I think, are great. They show it much better than I can draw it. This is probably something... There's a technique called freeze fracture, which is the way that we can look at um, components inside the cell... And what we do is we freeze the tissue, and then we fracture it, we break it. And it breaks along planes of weakness. And so what's happened here is the nucleus, being surrounded by a membrane, has remained sort of intact. And so we fractured the cell, and we can actually see the outside of the nucleus, the nuclear membrane. And if we have a look in much more detail, using transmission electron microscopy, we can see each one of these, and they look kind of cool, don't they? Kind of pretty, regular in shape. What's that, little flowers? Well, they're the pores. Look at them, there's loads of them. Loads of pores in the nuclear membrane. And those pores are um, proteins. They're a protein complex. So let's have a look at this diagram to show you how they work. Okay, there's the pores. The pores give an avenue or a connection between the inside and the outside. So, in a way, this protein molecule, or this protein complex, it's, um, it's got a hole running through it, right? Which connects the inside to the outside. And if I, this is if we were to look onto it, if I was to draw it. Okay. 
That's really not for 7.9. Sorry? That's really not. No, a lot of these figures, the, the figure numbers have changed. And I've just given up keeping up with the textbook changes. So there's an avenue of movement, a way to get in and a way to get out of the nucleus. Okay? Via these pores. But the proteins can regulate to some degree what goes in, what comes out. Okay? What kind of things might go, we've not covered it yet, I know, but just guess, what kind of things might go into the nucleus? Sure, Walter might, sorry? The RNA. RNA is actually made in the nucleus, all right? So what might need to go into the nucleus in order to make RNA? I heard someone give the answer. I'm sure I heard someone give the answer. Did someone say nucleotides? You did. Don't be shy. You didn't? Oh, look, you're going to take credit for it, though, aren't you? Nucleotides would go into the nucleus, okay? And RNA would come out. So things go in and out. There's a huge amount of traffic going in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And it, they are able to go through these pores. Now, the DNA that's in the nucleus is present as a substance called chromatin. So it's not just DNA. Chromatin is when your DNA is complexed with certain proteins. Okay? So chromatin is when the DNA is complex with certain proteins. That's what chromatin is. And when we talk about DNA, it's replication, transcription, translation, we'll talk about the proteins and some other things, all right? But I'll leave it for there right now. What were the little openings in the membrane called? Pores, nuclear pores. Okay, nuclear pores. You can add those to your diagram if you want. So the chromatin then is DNA and proteins, complex with proteins. The proteins are called histones. You don't need to write down the word histones now. We'll talk about those later. And it's the chromatin molecule which gets folded even further, which forms chromosomes. And I'm sure you've heard of chromosomes, yeah. So think of chromosomes as just long segments of chromatin. But they're only visible during cell division. And again, in a later week, we'll talk specifically about cell division. So the reason I'm saying what we're going to cover in later weeks is so that you, know, you can see the relevance of what we're doing now, right? how it applies to later weeks. Again, don't write this down, but it's just sort of for your FYI. Each species has a characteristic number of chromosomes, but that number may not be unique to that species. For example, humans have got 46 or 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay? They come in pairs. One of the pair comes from the sperm. One of the pair comes from the egg. Chimpanzees got 48. Fruit flies, very few, four pairs. But in the salivary glands of fruit flies, they have these enormous chromosomes that are very easy to see under the microscope, just enormous. Elephants, I don't know if it means just because you're bigger, you have more chromosomes. But anyway, I, that's not 10 pairs, obviously. It's a mistake. 56. A woolly mammoth, 58. Wheat has got 56 chromosomes. Okay? All right, so all of this stored within the nucleus. Why should you keep your DNA stored within the nucleus? What would be a benefit of keeping your DNA stored within the nucleus? Protect it. Yeah, protect it. The DNA contains all of the instructions to make all your proteins, right? You need it protected in a good, safe environment. And so the nucleus provides that, a good, safe environment to keep your DNA, keep it protected. This is something, I'm just going to give you this as sort of an added FYI. You don't need to take notes on the nucleolus. But the nu frequently within the nucleus, and you'll see this in today's lab, you see a little maybe darker area 
within the nucleus, a darker area, if you're using a stain especially. And that darker area we call the nucleolus. And that's a part of the nucleus where ribosomes are produced primarily. Ribosomes are big molecules, and so it gives the appearance of being kind of dense. Okay, so it's just a region within the nucleus specialised in making ribosomes. Okay, let's talk about ribosomes then. I'm not going to add these to the cell diagram just yet. All right, we'll talk about them, and then I'm going to add another structure, and we'll add the ribosomes to that. So ribosomes then. Ribosomes are organelles, but they are not membrane-bound organelles. Many of your organelles are bounded by a membrane, like the nucleus. Ribosomes are not. They're organelles, but they're big molecules. And they're composed of RNA and protein. And if you, know, if you remember nothing else about ribosomes, remember this. They are the site where proteins are made. They are the site where proteins are made. Yep. So if I never ate protein ever again in my life, would my body still produce it? Or do you have to have it in order to produce it? What are the building blocks of proteins? What are the monomers for proteins? Amino acids, right? Yeah. So, in order for your body to produce proteins, it needs the amino acid building blocks. Okay? Some of those amino acid building blocks your body can produce from scratch. Some of them it can't. So you have to take them in, in your diet. All right? Um, that said, if you eliminated protein from your diet, I think your health would seriously suffer. Yeah. yeah. So you need to take in those amino acids, and then your body can produce the proteins that it needs. Okay, it breaks down the proteins that you eat into amino acids, absorbs them into the blood, then into the cells, and then it will assemble the proteins it needs. Okay? And the proteins that your body makes are made on ribosomes. Ribosomes are amazing molecules. They can make any protein, any protein at all. And you have thousands upon thousands of different kinds of proteins. They can make any protein. It just depends on the information that you give the ribosome. So you tell the ribosome the sequence of amino acids, okay, and it will make a polypeptide chain in that sequence. Where does the information come from to determine the sequence of amino acids? It does RNA, and before that, DNA, the sequence of DNA in your genes, okay? All right. So, we have two kinds of ribosomes. They're not that different functionally, but sort of where they are and, and to some degree what they do is different. You've got free and bound ones. Free ribosomes and bound ribosomes. Okay. Is the They both make proteins. Okay, um, the, the fate of the proteins they make is a little different between the two. Are the ribosomes the little dots that hang out on the endoplasmic Yes, they are. And we're going to talk about the endoplasmic reticulum right now, then I'll add the ribosomes. Okay. So, this endomembrane system, eukaryotic cells have an endomembrane system. What does endo mean? Inside membrane. It means inside the cell there's a membrane system. Endomembrane system. And we'll look at the different components of the endomembrane system and they're either directly or indirectly linked. So they're either physically attached to each other or indirectly linked usually via vesicles. But they form, in some ways, they form this sort of production line.
So I think I should define this term vesicle as well, since I've used it quite a lot. Vesicles. They're simply small membrane-bound sacs that contain something, usually a chemical of some kind. So they're small membrane-bound sacs that contain a chemical of some kind. Yeah, and I've called it the UPS of the cell. If you need something moved around the cell, there's different ways of moving things around the cell, but you can put it in a vesicle and it will get transported from one place to another. So the vesicle, in a way, is like the cardboard box. Right? You can put stuff in it and move it around. And your cell is very good. Just like you should recycle your UPS cardboard boxes, right? So the cell recycles the membrane in the vesicles once stuff's been moved and taken out. So the membranes in your cell, your cell is a very, very, very dynamic environment. Things are changing all the time in response to things like your environment, your internal conditions, the external conditions, maybe what you've eaten, maybe whether you're sick, maybe your age, maybe some, something you've ingested. It's dynamically changing all the time. And so your membranes are changing all the time as well. The extent of the membrane system, the composition of the membranes, is just changing all the time. And I'll give you some examples of those in a moment. So, these are the different parts of the endomembrane system. First, we've got the nuclear envelope, which I've called the nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope. It's one part. And the nuclear envelope is attached to this structure called the endoplasmic reticulum. So I'm going to draw that now, and I'm going to add it to your cell. All right, I'm going to kind of draw it like this. Lots and lots of folds. Any time we have folding, what does that indicate? Sorry? Yes. Any time we have folding, it's to increase the surface area. Okay? Increase surface area. If we were to measure the surface area of this folded membrane, it's an awful lot more than if it was, if it was not folded, but occupied the same rough area. Okay? So let's label this, endoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk about the difference between rough and smooth in a moment. Okay? For right now, let's just call it the endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, what you might want to do is sort of label it like this, the ER. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum, because it's a bit of a mouthful, is very often abbreviated to the ER. Okay? The ER is the endoplasmic reticulum. And then we've got this substance, the Golgi apparatus. How do you think the Golgi apparatus got its name? Sorry? Named Golgi. Yeah, I think it's someone named Golgi. And with a name like that, it has to be Italian, right? I don't know if that's really true, but. So now let's draw the Golgi apparatus. It looks a bit similar to the ER. And that's my rendition of the Golgi apparatus. So right now we're just adding these to your diagram and then I'll go through and explain the functions of each of these. And then we've got lysosomes. Lysosomes, again, I'll give you a definition later, are like big vesicles that contain a very specific substance. So I'm just going to add them and label them. But I'll make them kind of large in size.
lysosomes. They're kind of like big vesicles. I'm not going to add vacuoles to this diagram of the cell. Vacuoles are things that are often found in plant cells. So these are, I know I've got, they're attached to each other. The nuclear envelope is contiguous with the ER, but there's no real physical connection between the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi, but they're connected via vesicles. So you've got lots of vesicles moving between the ER and the Golgi. And you've also got lots of vesicles leaving. So let's label these as vesicles. How do you spell vesicles? Is it an S or C? Or is it an SC? No? Then what? I before the C? V E S I C L E. V E S I C L E. Vesic. And then S? Sure? Is that right? No. Sorry? I need a U before where? Is that right? Is that correct? Sure? Brock, you said I need a U. Sure? If I'd have spelled it differently, would it have confused you? Oh, don't worry about vacuoles up there. Oh, no. This is vesicles. It's different to vacuoles. It's spelled differently, right? But is that the correct spelling for it? Yes. If I'd have spelled it differently, would it have confused you? No. No? <laughs> so, is spelling important? Yes. Yes. Spelling's very important. Okay. So, endoplasmic reticulum then. Think of your endoplasmic reticulum of this membranous network of highly folded membrane. Now, don't copy down exactly what's up there. I'm not fussed that you remember this word cisterny and cisternal space. All right, it's a term that you will use and learn in anatomy and physiology, mostly the physiology stuff, okay? But we've got these tubules and sacs. So this diagram up here is much better than I can draw it on the board, but it shows you how it's folded, and it shows you how you then get this compartmentalization. You've got sort of this environment inside here inside the tubules and at the end, at the extremities, it's more sac-like. And then you've got a different environment outside. So you've got kind of an environment in there and an environment out there. Yeah? Does the endoplasmic reticulum completely surround the nucleus? No, it doesn't completely surround. And you know what? It probably varies depending on the cell, but it can form a pretty elaborate network, but I don't think it completely envelops the nucleus, no. Does the side of the cell can still get to the outside of the nucleus on the back side? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. How is the endoplasmic reticulum and the apparatus connected? Via vesicles, not directly by direct attachment. At least I don't think they are. Is there an endoplasmic reticulum with every nuclear pore? No. No. Nope. So you've got this sort of folded network of membrane, which we call the endoplasmic reticulum, when you have a look at it on a transmission electron micrograph, you can see the membrane, right? It's quite highly folded, all these folds. That represents sort of like this section here, all right? And 
Un when you look at it on the electron, transmission electron micrograph, you'll notice that the surface of the ER, in some parts of it, appear rough. They've got these dots on. And some parts of it appear smoother. Out here at the extremities, there's no dots. See all these dots here? And there's no dots attached to the surface there. Those dots are ribosomes. So let's add those. I'm going to add them in red. And I'm not going to add it to all of the ER. But not so much at the extremities. A little more away from the extremities, right? You've got these dots. Now, some of them are attached to the ER, and some of them aren't. So, let's label these dots. Ribosomes. Those dots are the ribosomes. Okay? Are you going to differentiate between the ones that are attached to them and the ones that aren't? Yes. Okay, so the attached ones are connected to the surface of the ER, and the free ones, they're not attached directly to the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so the endoplasmic reticulum then, we refer to it as the smooth ER and the rough ER, depending on if there are ribosomes attached or not attached. And I'll address those separately, rough and smooth ER. Okay. So this diagram, I just blew up the one that I showed before, sort of nicely represents or shows you the sort of difference in where the smooth ER is on the extremities with no ribosomes, and then the rough ER more towards the interior, which is studded or dotted with ribosomes. And then it talks about the cisternal spaces. Okay, separation between sort of this interior ER environment and the exterior. So it separates the internal lumen from the side. Right, lumen is a word used to refer to um, like the space inside. I'll give you a, 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 an example that is very tangible to you. Okay, think about your digestive system, your gut. Right, it's like a tube, like a big long hose pipe. Okay, if we were to cut that, it would sort of look like that, okay? The lumen is the hole inside, okay? The space inside, that's what a lumen refers to. Your blood vessels have a lumen, it's just the space inside. So, the lumen of the ER is sort of the space inside, okay? The space inside where the folds are. I'll pick one here, look, see? This is a space inside, this would be the lumen and then we've got the outside. So these environments are different. How do you spell? L-U-M-E-N. Or is it I-N? I-N. Is it I-N? Yeah. I didn't think spelling was so important. When you say inside, do you mean externally or internally? In there. In there. Internally. Okay. Right. Okay, so smooth endoplasmic reticulum then. Oh, let's add to your diagram right now. We've got, and I'm going to denote it like this. I'm going to use the letter A to indicate smooth ER, so I'm going to put a little letter A here. And I'm going to put a little letter B here. Okay, and it just refers to the two different places on the endoplasmic reticulum. The rough one is where the ribosomes are, the bulk of them, the smooth one doesn't. Okay, 
and they're called rough and smooth because of how they looked under the transmission electron micrograph. So, why is it called the smooth ER? Because it looks smooth when you look at a transmission electron micrograph of it because it has no ribosomes on it, attached to it. Okay? It's got a very wide variety of functions. So now let's look at the function of the smooth ER. Lipids, phospholipids, Phospholipids make up what? Are a primary component of what? Membranes, right, good. And steroids. So lipids, phospholipids, and steroids. They're all synthesized on the smooth ER. <coughs> so if your cell needs to grow bigger, it needs to increase the amount of cell membrane it's got. Well, that cell membrane would be made on the smooth ER. In fact, what the smooth ER does, it just makes itself bigger, buds off a little bit, that moves to the outside of the cell, fuses with the membrane, and increases its size. Can you explain synthesis? Synthesis is just um, the production of. If you synthesize something, you make it. A lot of your carbohydrate metabolism occurs on your smooth ER. So, when we talked about carbohydrates in you, what carbohydrate metabolism did we refer to that would go on the smooth ER? We referred to one quite specific one. One of your carbohydrates, maybe the place where it's stored. Glycogen, good. So a lot of your glycogen is stored sort of in and around your smooth ER. And remember your liver is an organ that has a, a, a very large glycogen storage. The glycogen is stored around the smooth ER. Okay. And so when you need glucose, either because, I don't know, you've not had something to eat lately and your blood glucose levels dropped, around the smooth ER, especially in your liver, then enzymes cleave, break those bonds that stitch the glucose units together, making your glycogen molecule. Okay? Those glucose units then can be released from the cell into your blood. So think about this. Remember when we talked about the fight or flight mechanism, yeah? Right? When that happens, your smooth ER goes crazy, especially in your liver and muscles, because it goes, the enzymes go absolutely crazy and break off, break down as much of that glucose, glycogen as possible to pump glucose into your blood to give you that energy, well, into the cell as well, and into your blood, um, to give you the energy to run or fight. Okay? Detoxification of drugs and poisons, now the key role in the smooth ER. Now, when I say drugs and poisons, poisons are things that you may intentionally or unintentionally consume. So, for example, if you consume certain, um, certain plants, you know, many plants have chemicals in them that really are not that good for you. I mean, I don't want you to stop eating your, you know, fruits and vegetables, right? But some plants have chemicals that are not that good for you. And so they get detoxified, broken down on the smooth ER, primarily in your liver. Your liver does a lot of that. Things like E. coli and listeria, bacterial count in that under poisons? No. When we talk about poisons, we're just talking about chemicals. Just chemicals, not cells, not bacteria. Okay? Um, detoxification of drugs. So, um, you take something like uh, Tylenol or Ibuprofen. It's got a certain <coughs> life in your body, right? A certain half-life. It exists for a certain amount of time. So you take it, goes in your bloodstream, circulates around, and it has its effect, but your body breaks it down after a while. So the Ibuprofen or the Tylenol you might take, after a certain amount of time, it's broken down. 
and much of that breakdown occurs in the liver on the smooth ER. Okay? So your liver, in a way, is like your garbage disposal organ of the body. Yeah? It breaks down a lot of the drugs and poisons. That's why if you take something that's extremely toxic, your liver sometimes is the first thing that falls. It's really good at doing what it does, but if it's continually breaking down the poisons, then you know, it's the one hit with um, a lot of those toxic metabolic pathways for the poison breakdown. If you eat poisonous mushrooms, some of those poisons are broken down in the liver. Well, you end up with liver failure. Okay? If you consume too much alcohol, your liver is one organ that takes a huge hit. Yeah. Um, I know that ibuprofen is, goes through one place to, like one, I don't remember if it's ibuprofen or Tylenol. One is done in your stomach and one's the liver. Tylenol is the liver, ibuprofen is the kidney. Okay, the yeah. Tylenol, is, if you take a lot of Tylenol, it's hard on your liver. But, it is. So, I'll give you this as a good example of how the cells sort of dynamic and a detoxification process. In the liver cells, your endoplasmic reticulum can get bigger in response to alcohol consumption. So, for example, if you've never had, a, if you've never touched alcohol in your life, you could look at your liver cells and the, end of, and the smooth part of your endoplasmic reticulum, and it would be a certain size, and there'd be a certain amount of it. And let's just say you started to increase your alcohol content. Well, in response to that, your ER would get bigger. Your smooth ER gets more. The cell responds to that by adding to the size of your ER. So that there can be more enzymes to break down the alcohol that, keep, that you're consuming. Okay? And so that's where tolerance comes into. You know, what you'll find if you do drink alcohol is that, you know, maybe the first drink you have, you might feel a little weird after it. But people develop a tolerance to alcohol. And the foundation of that tolerance is that your liver cells, primarily, are increasing the size of their endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth part. So they're adding more enzyme. One key enzyme is called alcohol dehydrogenase, which is the enzyme that breaks down alcohol. And so you can consume more alcohol and not feel its effects because you've got more of the enzyme and more surface area, so you're breaking down it quicker. Okay? But, you know, I don't want to paint the picture that you can drink as much as you like and your liver can handle it because it can't. And calcium ions are stored in your smooth ER, and that's very important for muscle contraction. And when you, uh, when you go into your physiology classes, you'll learn about the physiology of muscle contraction. We're not going to talk about it in this class. And you'll see the role of calcium ions in causing, um, facilitating muscle contraction. So what's this? A it's a liver, it is. What's this? Gallbladder. It is, gallbladder in your liver. <laughs> yeah? Now this is a tiny little liver. It's not a human liver, it's a dog's liver. Your liver's much bigger than that. Okay. I had my... I think you've been living away like seven pounds. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. don't know. Wouldn't surprise me. It's the biggest organ in your body. Really? All right. Yeah. Other than your skin? Yeah, well, your skin. Yeah, I don't... I, your skin covers a huge area. I don't know which one of them is more massive, but <laughs> the liver has the most mass, I guess. So there's your gallbladder. I had my gallbladder out about six years ago, and um, they do it endoscopically, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very cool. And I asked the surgeon... Um, if I could get a copy of the video that the camera shot as he was doing it. And he was a bit reluctant, but in the end he did it. I said, you know, it's, um, you know, I'm, it's what, I'm a biologist and I'm kind of curious about it. But it was so cool to watch. They put the camera in and then they put these other probes in and they're like busting through your abdominal wall, these like sharp, you know, um, probes with a sharp pointed needle on. But I watched the whole thing, my gallbladder getting taken out. And as I was watching it, I found myself going, oh, that's got hurt. Oh, hurts. And then when they cauterize it inside, see all this, you know, you don't hear the sound, but you can see all the steam of when they're cauterizing things. Um, I can't remember where the video is, though. I've got to dig it up. I should dig it up really and show you guys, shouldn't I? It's, it's cool. It's really cool. All right, so there's your liver. Think about your liver. Think about your smooth endoplasmic reticulum, what the smooth endoplasmic reticulum does. There, if we were to do a cross-section through your liver, that's what it might look like. What are all these holes? Blood vessels, yeah. Your liver is an extremely vascular organ. All right, huge amount of blood, blood flow through your liver. All right, it's one 
you know, one reason why you store so much glycogen there. Huge blood flow means it can get it out to the rest of your body quickly. Now, my mum used to cook us liver and bacon when I was a kid growing up in England. And I remember there were some chewy parts to it, and it was the blood vessels that were very chewy because they've got a very muscular wall to them. And so you'd chew it, and you couldn't really chew it, and you'd spit that little bit out. But the rest of the liver tissue is very soft. Yeah? Kind of melts in your mouth, if you like, liver. So there's one of those chewy blood vessels, look. And look at the liver. Isn't it sort of like all these little units, yeah? It's not completely... You know, there's not a lot of, there's kind of some symmetry or repetition, but it's not, you know, perfect repetition. Oh, so, think about the little liver cells in there, breaking down the drugs, the alcohol, and the other stuff that you're ingesting. Okay, so now let's have a look at the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And why is it called the rough ER? Because it looks rough on a transmission electron micrograph. And it is rough because it's got ribosomes on its surface. So what are the functions of the rough ER? Now, I've got here manufactures secretory proteins. Let me explain that. The rough ER itself doesn't manufacture the proteins. Where are the proteins made? Ribosomes. Okay? The ribosome just happens to be located on the rough ER. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it manufactures, it's the site where the ribosomes are, and so the site where these secretory proteins are made. What do I mean by secretory? Secretory means things that are secreted. All right, so what does secreted mean? Yeah, things that are released from the cell. Okay, things that are released. Produced in the cell, taken to the exterior, and then released. They're secreted. Think about it this way. Snails and slugs secrete mucus. All right, they produce it and then they release it to the outside. Are secretions always toxic that we're releasing? Oh, no, absolutely not. You make, many of your secretions are, are completely not toxic. I would imagine the majority of them are not toxic. Okay. So, manufactured secretory proteins. So, proteins that are secreted are made on the endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum. So, the ribosomes synthesize the proteins. Right? That's where the proteins are made. As the ribosome is stitching together the amino acids, it's emerging from the ribosome, and then it folds. It adopts its secondary and tertiary structures. And then very often, it's modified. The protein is modified. And here's a good example. So, you might have something, a protein, that's made on the rough ER. It's then usually packaged into a vesicle, that protein. That vesicle is then moved over to the Golgi apparatus, where it's modified. And here's an example of how one of those proteins can be modified. Some of your proteins are complexed with carbohydrates. And then we call it a glycoprotein. Glyco refers to sort of glucose or carbohydrate proteins, protein, glycoprotein. And I'll give you a good example of this. Your salivary glands, right? If you push up in here, you can find your salivary glands, right? And your salivary glands are a little gland, and they make loads of saliva. Okay? And there are ducts at the, sort of under your tongue at the back, and there are a couple of little ducts under your tongue. What's this little string on your tongue called? Frenulum. Uh, your frenulum, right, the little, little <coughs> attachment. There are ducts there and ducts at the back. 
okay, where your salivary glands, they're producing loads of saliva and they're releasing it into your mouth through those ducts. Now saliva is mostly water, right? But it contains some other things. It contains glycoproteins. One of the glycoproteins it contains is a very sort of slimy, mucousy glycoprotein. Why would you need to produce all this slimy... You can swallow. Yeah, it lubricates your mouth. Yeah, think about if you didn't, if you didn't have all that saliva, or if it was just water, how dry your mouth would be, right? So you produce all this saliva, which has all of these glycoproteins in. One particular glycoprotein is very, very slimy. And it's what makes, gives your mouth that sort of sliminess, and it lubricates your mouth and your throat and so on. It's for lubrication. Anybody drink, anybody a tea drinker? Anybody drink like black tea? Black tea without milk? Yeah, no? If you drink black tea without milk, it's quite astringent. That means when you drink it, doesn't your mouth sort of feel dry? A bit puckery? Yeah, especially if you've left the tea bag in too long. Because what's happening is, the black tea contains tannins. Tannins are a naturally produced plant substance that precipitate out proteins. The tannins bind to proteins. So the glycoprotein that is in your mouth, the tannins bind to them and they stop them acting as glycoproteins. They stop that lubricating effect. So that's why your mouth feels really dry. Right? So if you were civilized, you would put milk in your black tea, right? Milk contains protein, so the tannins in the black tea combine with the milk protein, so you can drink it without making your mouth feel dry. What do you do with that red wine? Sorry? What do you do with that red wine? Ah, red wine. You know what? You absolutely you don't want to add cheese? milk to red wine, do you? <laughs> so that's how you drink tea in England mostly, with milk. That's the civilized way to do it, right? But many of the herbal teas, you don't have that problem because they're made with plant parts that don't have a lot of tannins in. All right, so proteins are modified, very often complexed with carbohydrates. And then they're packaged in vesicles. And they can be moved to another part of the cell or secreted from the cell. So you can think about your salivary glands. Loads of this... Um, the glycoprotein, the proteins made on the ribosomes, modified, carbohydrates added, put into vesicles, the vesicles move to the outside and they release all of this saliva with the glycoprotein into the ducts of your salivary gland and then it makes its way into your mouth. Your salivary gland also produces other things. There's an enzyme it produces. Do you remember what that enzyme's called? No? It's the one that breaks down starch. You can chew on starch and it will start to taste a little bit sweet. Salivary amylase. Right, salivary amylase is the name of that enzyme. Okay. And the raffiar also makes membrane that can be used to make or increase the number of some of your other organelles. And it simply makes its own membrane bigger and then buds off part of it. Moves that around and it can either make more, provide the membrane for more organelles or increase the size of, size of organelles. Okay, so now let's talk about the Golgi apparatus. Okay, this structure here. And again, it's made of folded membrane that's to keep separate the inside from the outside. Again, don't write all of this down. You know, read it, write down what you need, I'll explain it. It's described as being made of these stacked, flattened sacks. But you know, the way you draw it, I think, sort of shows you how its structure is. Okay? And some of these are separate. In other words, it's, they're not, it's not one contiguous inside. There may be layers like pancakes, 
where they're sort of stacked on top of each other. Does that make sense? So individual, not all one. Well, a little bit of both. Maybe sort of like that, and there's some connection between them. So the role of the Golgi then, this is what the Golgi apparatus does. It stores, sorts, ships, and modifies products from their endoplasmic reticulum. All right? It can store, sort, modify, and ship things made on the endoplasmic reticulum. <coughs> so here's our sort of like flow. Here's our direction of flow. On our ribosomes, maybe they're producing a protein or something. That protein might get modified. It's packaged in a vesicle, moved in the vesicle to the Golgi. The Golgi might then store it. Or it might sort things out because there's different molecules there. Or itself might modify them a little bit. As it moves through the Golgi, then that modified substance at some point will be put into a vesicle again and then transported to another part of the cell or for release from the cell. Okay? So can a smooth or a rough ER go through again? That's where smooth or rough goes? I'm not understanding. I don't understand the question, Penny. I'll, I'll draw a diagram, I'll show you right now how we go from sort of here to vesicles to here. Okay? Let's look real close at the surface of the ER. Say I'm just going to look at that surface part there. Okay. This is how vesicles sort of bud off and vesicles are formed. you'll get maybe a little pocket form like that. And the substance which needs to go in the vesicle There's your vesicle. Can you see how that works? Right? So the endoplasmic reticulum stays where it is, but these little vesicles are budding off all the time. And then they can move to other parts of the cell. So let's just say that this vesicle has just been formed here. Here's our vesicle. And it needs to move to the Golgi apparatus. The vesicle itself doesn't move through, but the vesicle itself fuses to the membrane of the Golgi, releases its content inside the Golgi apparatus, and it still may be um, compartmentalized to a large degree, because you can't have everything mixing, but then things do move through. Is this the same concept as an ovary releasing an egg? No. Eggs are, well, no, they're not. It's not. Can you see how that works, though? Yeah? So now I'll show you this vesicle, how it would fuse with, say, uh, the membrane of the Golgi apparatus and release its contents inside. It's just this in reverse. So here's this part of the Golgi apparatus, say, and this is just about to fuse to it, this vesicle. There's the substance that it contains. So contact, and remember the blue structure is membrane, and this is membrane also. So it's almost like um, bubbles, when you blow bubbles, one bubble sort of connects to and fuses to another one, right? Yeah, same kind of deal. I don't need to draw the red dots, do I, on this one? Anything that's made on the ER. So it could be literally any protein. OK. 
Okay, so can you see how that works? See how vesicles are made and how they uh, release their content to something else? They just kind of fuse and release.